Today we're looking at the foundation of a fat punchy drum sound, choosing the right microphone and placement. Coming up. Hey what's up, Toby Dera here from UMC, bringing you some of the best tips and tricks to make you a better sounding drummer. If you want to make your real drum recording sound awesome and match modern sound standards, you have to master quite some steps. Every drum set, room and microphone is different, so the process of drum recording is always try and error and knowing the principles which we are talking about in this video. I already did several comparison videos on this channel with different microphones, different heights, different angles on bass drum, snare drum, toms, overheads so you get a feel for the differences. Those videos are all about the studio experience for you guys to see every combination and hear and find what you like best. Today on the other hand I will show you my favorite drum mic positions on my recording set behind me and the principles that I use to get my sound. First of all we have to cover some basics which come full circle when we place the mics on the set. When choosing and placing your microphones you are already deep in the process of mixing your drum sound. So you really have to know what you're going for. Are you going for warm and mellow tones or cracking and punchy sounds? Therefore, step one is choosing the right instrument. If you want to have a lot of attack, go with clear drum heads. If you want to have a warmer sound, go with coated drum heads. If you want to have a brighter sound, go with single ply heads. And if you want to have a fat sound, go with double ply heads. Now to the meat and potato. Why is placement so important? On drums there are so many instruments producing sound at the same time, therefore you almost never get an isolated signal without crosstalk. Overhead and room microphones are there to give an overall sound impression of the drum set. On the other hand you have direct micing positions which in the best case give you an isolated impression of that specific instrument without any crosstalk. For example, snare drum, kick drum and toms. Now there are different microphone types and characteristics to get those jobs done, like the overall impression of a drum set or room or the close direct signal, as well as frequency boosts and detail resolution. Let's move fast here because we don't want to spend too much time on the basics you might already know. There are three types of microphones, dynamic, condenser and ribbon mics. Dynamic mics are the most popular ones. Upsides, Simple mechanics, handle out signals very well, are robust, good at background noise reduction and are the most affordable ones. Downsides, low dynamic sensitivity and lack of a full frequency response. Most of the time in the really high end and really low end. Overall they are perfect for live situations and reducing crosstalk. Condenser microphones have more complex mechanics. Upsides, they have a wider frequency response, especially in the really high and really low frequencies. They have a more natural sound and a higher sensitivity. Downsides, they pick up a lot more crosstalk, they are more fragile and in most cases they are more expensive. So in general they are perfect for high detailed studio situation in treated rooms. Next microphone type is the ribbon microphone. They are sounding warmer and a little bit more vintage with a really special sound characteristic. But they are really fragile and expensive. Next basic is the microphone characteristic. The widest characteristic is omnidirectional. It records sounds from all sides and angles. This means it will also record the reflections of a room, for example. And on the other hand you have characteristics that are more focused on their polar response patterns. For example the cardioid characteristic. As you can see cardioid characteristics reject all sounds coming in from the back of the microphone and that's why I have almost only cardioid microphones and subcardioid microphones what is a mix between cardioid and omnidirectional. When positioning your microphones it is really important to know the characteristic of your microphone so you don't record crosstalk from the side or from the back of your microphone. So now that we made up our mind what sound we are going after and how to eliminate crosstalk we are going to the most exciting chapter positioning. To kick this chapter off I will give you rules of thumb so you can uh, go for your sound what you're going for on your drum set with your microphones in your room and find it in this process. Aiming for the center will give you more attack and a more focused sound. Aiming for the edge will give you a more complex sound, a little more overtones and ring. Getting close to the drum head increases low frequencies. 
especially with condenser microphones. The closer you are at the sound source, the louder the main signal is compared to all other crosstalk of the drum set, which is a good thing. Moving away from the sound source increases the room sound or room reflections and can add bleed from other drum parts. For example, cymbal sounds in the tom mics. Every mic pair that is capturing a stereo image, overheads, room mics, should be the same distance from your snare so it appears in the center. When you're using more than one mic on a drum, make sure to check the phase. I will go in depth on how I manage phase later. Alright, finally, now that you have all the basic knowledge and the context, we can hop onto the set and look how I position my microphones to get my sound. Let's do this! Uh, Alright, so let's start with the overheads. Because overheads are the backbone of your drum sound. If you can capture a good impression of the whole drum kit with your overheads, you are most of the time already halfway there. From there only incorporate a little bit of the close mics and most drum recordings should be fine and done right there. I'm doing it slightly different with my recordings because I record a lot of metal drums and they need to be punchy and direct. So I am using my overhead microphones as a spaced pair. That means far right, far left, uh, really spread out. And uh, I try to only capture the symbols in the first place. One of the basic rules, as I said before, uh, we need to make sure that the snare drum is in the center of the overheads later in the recording. When we pan the overhead to right and left, so the snare drum appears in the center. Therefore, I use a cable like everybody else, um, put one end on the center of the snare drum and measure the length of this side of the overheads. And then we move to this side and see if it matches. Next up, we stick to the cymbals with a hi-hat mic This is absolutely just a support mic for me because hi-hats are always super loud in the overheads. I only want the high end for a definition. That's why I use a condenser mic on this as well. It is as high as it can get without too much bleed from the crash cymbal here. So this is roughly one hand apart from the hi-hat. Same thing for the right symbol, it is only for support. It's roughly one hand apart from the right symbol. It's a cardioid characteristic, so I point the back of the microphone to the loud crash symbol. So this mic uh, is taking in not that much bleed from the crash symbol. All right, now moving on to the toms. This is probably my favorite part because I'm going super extra on the toms. Because I'm recording a lot of metal music with the UMC, I want my toms to have extra attack and extra low end. And therefore I'm using condenser microphones. The trick here is that uh, condenser microphones have a high resolution, so this can capture all the high end details and the click and the attack of the clear drum head, as well as when I'm moving closer to the drum head, I can increase the low end response. So this can almost sound like a little bass drum. What I like. I'm positioning the microphone three fingers from the drum head and three fingers from the edge. This is much further in uh, than most guys because I don't want to have the ring of the drum on the sides, uh, I'm really getting close to the center, so I have a really focused signal with a lot of attack. And I know that I won't hit those microphones when I'm playing, because I'm, I try to play really precise. Not for most drummers. Another plus, in my opinion, for these mics on the toms is uh, that the cymbal bleed uh, really sounds nice on these mics all around. The cymbal bleed is still pretty quiet uh, because I'm really going into the sound source and to the center of 
the drum. Moving on to the snare drum, I have three snare drum microphones and every single one adds to the snare drum sound that I'm looking for. First of all, we have one dynamic microphone. Uh, it has a really raw um, attack. We have a condenser microphone. The exactly same like for the Tom Toms. This adds uh, the really high frequencies for the attack and uh, the low mids punch for the snare drum. Here I'm also checking the face because I'm using more than one microphone for uh, this instrument. I'm looking that the capsules of the microphones have the same distance to the center of the drum. Placement is pretty close to the drum head, so I have a lot of bottom end and low mids, like the 200 hertz. Um, this is two fingers from the drum head and like two, most of the time, three fingers uh, in from the rim. So as well, pretty close to the center of the drum, um, just so that I don't hit it. Not recommended for everybody. It can get really expensive. For the bottom mic, I uh, try to keep things simple. Absolute, total, dynamic, microphone standard. Pointing at the wires of the snare drum. This is for the really high-end sizzle of the snare drum. And uh, most of the time it adds a little bit more body as well to the snare. Pretty overkill, but I love my snare drum sound. Really happy with this. All right, for the kick drum, we have two microphones. And those have always been my go-to for kick drum sound. Super awesome combo. Uh, we have one microphone on the outside. This is to pick up the low end of the resonant head of the kick drum. This is where all the low end from a kick drum comes from. So this is placed in the hole in the middle. In the inside we have a boundary condenser microphone. It's this one. And this is for the high end metal kick that crushes your head at concerts or in the mix. Those two combined will give an absolutely stunning kick drum sound. This microphone is placed in the middle of the kick drum. That's it. All right, last but not least, we have the room mics. We have two condenser mics. Each is pointing at the cymbals at a height like 1.8 meters, the far right and far left side of the drums. Um, we have an, a huge diffuser in this room. On this side it really sounds lively and has some reflections. And the other side of the room is really dead and, and punchy with dry signals, what is perfect for metal and what I do. I should add like an omnidirectional uh, microphone or two, like a stereo pair here for uh, the benefits of the diffuser. But this is the lesson for budget. That's the next level, but you can do so much with uh, those four room mics and uh, some processing. And that's the way I roll. This microphone uh, is a leftover. It's a dynamic microphone pointing directly at the wall. It should have no space between the wall and the microphone. So it really boosts the low end and I would crush this with compression and stuff. Sometimes it sounds good, sometimes not. So this is just a random mic thrown in there. So now that we talked about my microphone choices and the positioning, let's go to the drum set and see how it sounds.
So, last thing we have to talk about is phase management. Phase is when you hit an instrument, like a snare drum for example, the sound travels and hits the mic capsules at a certain time. When the microphones are in phase to each other and you zoom in into your DHW, you will see that the waveforms will go in unison with each other up and down. Which whenever played back should give you a fat full sound without frequency cancellations. When the recorded waveforms are out of phase, they will crash into each other and cancel frequencies, which lead to weak and uh, thin sound. You can manage your phasing in two ways. First way is on the drum set. You start with a microphone, most of the times the overheads, do this with a cable so they are in phase, and then slowly add microphone by microphone and always record and check the phase in the DHW. This process is really time consuming and always a compromise for each instrument, but a lot of people swear by it. Second way to manage your face is in post-production. And that is the process I'm using. I record my session, I go into the DHW, I take the waveforms and align them so they are perfectly aligned like the tom-toms with the overheads, the snare with the overheads, kick drum with the overheads. So I have perfect phase and I perfectly see which ones are not in phase and needs to be flipped. You can go pretty close to this uh, by placing the microphones, but you can't erase the delay of the tom-tom mic and the overheads or snare drum and overheads. A lot of people like this, that's preference. All right, you guys, that's it for the video of how to choose and place your microphones. We already touched a little bit on the post-production of a drum recording, but that's something for another video in the future. If you liked this video and you could learn something from it, hit that like button. And if you want to learn more in the future about comparisons, how to drum gear and recording, hit that subscribe button. And hopefully we will see each other in the next videos. Bye.